Well, good morning. Thank you for joining me as we go through the book of Revelation beginning today. Today is going to be all about the introduction to the Revelation, one of the greatest books in the entire Bible. I pray that you'll enjoy it during this great time together. I know that as we move forward, most of our recordings will be done in the church and not in my home office like we're having to do today. So uh, the video recordings should get better and better as we move along. Just want to thank you again for joining us. And if you have your Bible app, join me uh, in Revelation chapter one, starting with the first verse. And it says this, the revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ. Whatever he saw, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep what is written in it because the time is near. So even at the beginning, as we begin our study, you're going to see that there is a blessing promised to those uh, who read this, uh, who read this scripture and who keep the words of it. And that applies to you as well. So again, hope you enjoy this. We're going to use Zoom today uh, since we're recording at home. And I'll have some slides for you. So we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and share my screen. And so bear with me as we set this up for you. And uh, what we'll do is uh, allow you to see uh, what I'm looking at. And if you would like these notes, just email me at mlangner at cpcfamily.org. And uh, I'll have that for you again at the end as we, uh, as we go forward. All right, so again, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ and an introduction. Uh, note, notice uh, even here right at the beginning that, um, that this is a revelation of Jesus Christ. This is directly from the Lord himself to his apostle John. And uh, later in the book of Revelation, it says this, I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, the one who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. For many people, uh, there are different key verses in this uh, in this scripture, including 119 and 41, and we'll go through those as well. But for me, this verse, I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, the one who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty, is the key verse to this scripture because it lets you know exactly who is giving this revelation to John. Uh, the The Word revelation, of course, comes from apocalypsis, uh, which means to unveil, to disclose, to reveal. And uh, it's, it's one of three types of literature that you'll find in the revelation. Uh, one, of course, is that of the apocalypse, so a lot of symbol symbolism and imagery and things like that. And then secondly, you'll find there's a lot of prophecy here. I believe that most of the things that we're going to talk about over the next several months together uh, are not are, have not happened yet. And so uh, this is still a very much a prophetic book, but it's also a letter. It was given to the seven churches in Asia, which is now modern day Turkey. We'll talk about that in a bit, uh, but just understand that the literature of Revelation is incredibly unusual. And uh, as we move forward, we'll talk about just how unusual that is. Something else to, uh, to appreciate here is the look at the Old Testament that you must take to really understand Revelation. At least uh, 278 verses out of 404 are drawn from the Old Testament, but interestingly, not one is directly quoted. So the Old Testament uh, was certainly something in John's mind uh, as he received this message from the Lord. And as he received these different visions, there were seven different visions, which we'll talk about later. But he received these different visions from the Lord, all one revelation from Jesus Christ. So extremely interesting. Uh, John was, uh, this was written around 95 AD, I believe, by the Apostle John uh, on the island of Patmos, where he had been, he had been sent by Domitian. And uh, you'll see the various churches here. Uh, starting from, from the north, uh, Pergamon, Thyatira, Smyrna, Sardis, Philadelphia, Ephesus, and Laodicea. So you have these different 
churches in what is now modern day Turkey. Uh, and this is where John said that he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Now, how much we should all appreciate that statement that we're to be in the spirit on the Lord's day, but that is where John was. Um, and here's another picture of, of that island. It was really more of a rock quarry than anything, particularly at that time. Uh, today, it is a, uh, a destination site that you can, you can see this, uh, I believe, is from the deck of a cruise ship. Uh, but again, that is the island of Patmos. So you can actually see where John wrote the, uh, the revelation or recorded the revelation from Jesus. And uh, there's significant evidence uh, to... Uh, that John did in fact write this book. Book uh, for one thing, the language is remarkably similar to John's gospel and to John's letters, including uh, phrases that he used a tremendous amount. Uh, the word "true," the Lamb of God. Um, I think twenty-eight times it's it's Jesus is referred to as the Lamb of God in the Revelation, and you'll see that consistently in his other books as well. Uh, the, the phrase, I signify, tribulation, out of, witness, thunder, life, and the word. Over and over again, you, you see uh, Jesus referred to as the word, particularly in the Gospel of John. So we see, again, similar phrasing. Obviously, the style of writing is going to be a little different. That may have been because with the book of John, in the epistles, he may have had a secretary or someone who could record the words as he gave them, whereas on Patmos, he was likely by himself. And, uh, and so the, the idea that the phraseology or the grammar would be slightly different is, is not remarkable at all, in my opinion, uh, especially considering just the extraordinary number of phrasings uh, that are similar to the other books that John wrote. Uh, John was also a known and recognizable pastor in Asia, particularly at Ephesus. And uh, during this time, Paul had already come and gone and had established all of these churches with some of his fellow uh, missionaries. And John came along and became a pastor uh, during this time between the 70s and the, and the early 90s, perhaps. And, uh, and so he was, he was there during this time. So it makes perfect sense that he would be the one that the Lord gave him, uh, gave this uh, revelation to. And then third, uh, Polycarp was a disciple of John, a direct disciple of John, stated so himself. And he told Irenaeus, who was his own disciple, that the apostle John was the writer. So now we have almost a first-hand account uh, you're talking about one generation that skipped here, and the and the one generation that was skipped is actually the one that knew John personally. So I take that as extraordinarily good evidence that John the Apostle wrote this. And then finally, and this is uh, just of my own belief, I believe that Jesus uh, had a special place in his heart for the Apostle John, who was his youngest disciple. And John uh, was, of course, the only one that we believe was not martyred. Uh, the Lord, uh, even at the end of the, the Gospel of John, tells us that there was a special call on John's life, and, and Jesus allowed him to fulfill that call. It wasn't that the other apostles did not have special calls too, but theirs was a call to martyrdom um, after spreading the Gospel of Jesus Christ. But John instead was given this great revelation at the end of a long, old, faithful life, and what a blessing that must have been for him. The purpose of the book is specifically stated, it is the only New Testament book to do so. It shows Jesus's servants, that's you and that's me, what must soon take place. Uh, we'll get into this as we move forward, especially the part about what soon means, uh, but understand that this was written and given to John in a futuristic sense. A revelation in te teaches many important concepts, but I'll focus on five as we get started today. First, uh, Jesus is the focus. This, this book is from Jesus, it is about Jesus, and it is for the benefit of Jesus Christ. 
uh, a friend of mine uh, wrote a, a dissertation on, uh, on the worship passages of the Revelation. And in this, and in this uh, dissertation, she talked about just how much worship is a part of this message. And we'll see this as we move forward, that Jesus from the beginning to the end of Revelation is the focus and that he should be the focus and that he is triumphant in our focus. And so we'll talk more about that as we move along. Secondly, that the church is important to Jesus Christ. Although we will contend that the current day church will not be part of Revelation 4 through 19, uh, we certainly see Jesus's concern for the church in the latter chapters of Revelation, but more specifically in chapters one through three, Jesus had a particular message for the church. And in a couple of weeks, we'll take a look at what that message uh, was. Uh, we should take from that immediately that Jesus is concerned about the, the present day condition of the church. And we'll, we'll talk about that a, a great deal. Uh, third, that Israel will return to the promised land. Of course, this beginning of this happened in 1948 when Israel was allowed to, to return to a part of their land. They're still today not, uh, not completely inhabiting all of the land that God gave them, um, but they are, they are back in the promised land. There will be a future temple built in Jerusalem. And praise the Lord for that. Uh, but we'll need to remember that Israel is, is God's chosen people. Uh, I am not a believer in replacement theology, and we'll talk about that as we go along. Um, the church did not replace Israel. Uh, so there are, some, there are some differences of opinion there, and we'll, we'll talk about that a great deal. Uh, finally, uh, our, our fourth on this list, judgment and grace are consistent themes. And that seems incongruent that it can't be, that that can't be, but judgment and grace are both themes of this book. And we're going to get to see in the revelation, the greatest revival, if you will, of all time. It will be after this current church is gone, but there will be a future church during the revelation led by Israel uh, itself. And we'll talk about that uh, as we move forward. And then finally, Christ's millennial reign will begin. We'll talk a little bit about the millennial reign this morning. Obviously, that's not until late into the revelation and uh, as far as studying this in detail, but I want you to have an idea of what some people believe and what I believe. As we move forward, I'm going to get some key terms out of the way. That way, as we start really getting into the scriptures themselves over the next several weeks, you'll have an understanding about what these key terms mean. Uh, first of all, when you think about the timing of the events, when did this happen or has it happened or when will it happen? Um, there are different perspectives on this. One is called the preterist view and preterists believe that the book is primarily for believers of the first century. Uh, to hold this, they virtually ignore all the prophetic portions of Revelation, perhaps allegorizing that in some sense. Uh, the next two groups particularly use symbolism uh, or, or an allegorical mindset. Um, historicists believe the Revelation is about the church age, essentially replaces the Abrahamic covenant, and it's highly metaphorical. I definitely do not agree with this. Again, I am not a replacement theologian. The church did not replace Israel. Uh, the church was actually grafted in under Israel. Uh, and the Bible's very clear about that. Paul's very clear about that. A third view is that of the idealist. They believe that this book is just a metaphor for the battle between good and evil. It requires an allegorical interpretation of the book. I like metaphor. Uh, I like allegory when you're trying to tell a story. Uh, one of uh, one friend is Lynn Sweet, and he is like the king of, of metaphor. But in this particular, um, uh, but in this particular book, this is not the way to take it. In my opinion, there is nothing in Revelation that leads me to believe that this is just an allegory. Of, of a battle that's, that's taking place. For one thing, 
that battle has been taking place since Genesis, since Genesis. And we know that uh, with the fall, that, uh, that, that at that point, this battle between the enemy of God and uh, Satan and God himself began in real earnest as far as human beings were concerned. And so, uh, and so there's a lot there. We'll talk about that. You'll be surprised at how much Genesis and Revelation relate. You'll be surprised perhaps how much the, the fall and all of the, the ill things that happened because of that in Genesis are reconciled in this amazing book of Revelation. And then finally, and this is the one that I'll hold to, uh, futurists believe that Revelation is a literal revealing to the seven churches, so that was to the current churches of that time, the seven churches of Asia, or now Turkey, and the ecumenical church, that's the overall Christian church. Um, I, I, futurists believe in that the that Daniel's 70th week is the is the consummation or the culmination of the Abrahamic covenant to Israel. And finally, uh, futurists believe that this that this uh, that this book, particularly beginning in chapter four and uh, and going all the way through 22, is something that will happen in the future. I definitely am uh, of the futurist view. I believe that it has the, the futurist view is the best, most literal understanding of scripture itself. And one of the great rules of thumb is that you treat scripture literally unless it is incredibly obvious that it is symbolic, um, unless it is contextually obvious that it is symbolic. There are two key verses. I, I gave you uh, I, I've given you uh, several this morning, but uh, but this one, therefore, write what you have seen, what is, and what will take place after this. The key, the, after this is a key word. And then again, after this, I looked, and there was and there in heaven was an open door. The first voice that I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, so it's referring back to chapter one, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. So again, that phrase after this re is repeated multiple times and notice that this is in red and I did that on purpose for you. This is Jesus talking. These So these are future events uh, from the time of John forward. Uh, we're not going to get into this a ton today as we move into chapter four and then really into chapter six. We'll talk about the timing of the rapture. rapture. Most most futurists believe um, that the rapture or a snatching away um, uh, of the current church uh, will take place. I am definitely one of those. Uh, I find it alarming when people are not, bluntly. Um, the rapture and the second coming, or the second coming, um, uh, is one event, but it, it is, it is, it's kind of like baking a cake. When someone says, I've baked a cake, well, they may bake part of it at one point, and then they put the icing on it at the other point, but if, but it was one event. They baked a cake, and then at some point, you'll get to eat it, and obviously, looking at me, you can tell I like cake. So we get to see here this, this event of the second coming. I'll show you verses that point to a rapture of the current church, uh, where Paul specifically talks about uh, about the about the church being absent. Um, we'll get to see the future church that will take place during the revelation time. And we'll discuss this again in detail in chapter six. Just understand that I'll take a pre-tribulation perspective. I don't believe that the that the church is appointed to wrath. And I don't believe this is a time period that is for the current day church. I think it is all about Israel and the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. If you, if you don't understand uh, at this point, the 70th week of Daniel, we do have a video available from several weeks ago uh, where I went from uh, through Daniel chapter nine. I think uh, that would be very beneficial as you go into this, into this study. Uh, the timing of the millennial kingdom. There are definitely different opinions on this. 
uh, I will, uh, I'll, I'll have a view and it's okay if you have a different view, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll go through the different ones. The amillennial view. So uh, ah, of course, means um, in this, in this context means they don't believe in a millennial view. Um, they don't believe that there will be a future literal 1000 reign of Christ. They believe that the kingdom is spiritual in nature and is presently fulfilled as Christ reigns in heaven and his people. It's, it's, there's a lot of symbolism in this, and it's symbolic of a long, of a long church age. Uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a fan of this view personally. Um, I, I don't think that this book was meant to, uh, to be as symbolic as some people might think, even though symbolic imagery was used. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Post, the post-millennial view teaches that Christ will return after the millennium, an undetermined time when Christians influence the earth's people as they become ready for Christ's return. People who, um, people who do not believe that the second coming is, occurs in two phases uh, sometimes we'll take a post-millennial view. Again, not my view, but it is definitely out there. It is, it is not a prevalent view, particularly at this point. I would say the amillennial view uh, has risen in, in more recent years, uh, but the, uh, in the overarching view in the, in the evangelical church as a whole is the premillennial view, which is the one that I definitely hold. Uh, it concludes that Christ will return during the second phase of the second coming, and then the rapture, and then Daniel's 70th week being the first phase. We'll talk about that as we, as we move forward, um, and I believe that there are a lot of reasons to hold the premillennial view. First, it is for sure the view that best fulfills the Abrahamic and Mosaic promises, the promises to Israel are everlasting. Scripture plainly tells us that they're everlasting. Um, they offer the clearest understanding of Revelation 21 through 6. That is the fall of Satan and what happens to him. It is definitely the most literal view of Revelation chapter 20. Uh, it's the earliest view of the church. Uh, most of the early church were premillennial, uh, held the premillennial view. Most held a strong view of, of John the Apostle as the author, and we'll talk a little bit about why some of that changed over the years. It is the most literal interpretation of Satan's current role, his future incarnation, and ultimate destiny. Uh, those are very encouraging words, and it's the most consistent literal rendering of Scripture, in my opinion. And again, I know that uh, there are varying opinions out there, um, but my belief is that the premillennial view is the best, and we'll talk about that when we get uh, when we get to this chapter. Uh, but again, these are understanding these different timings and events and and beliefs are important as you go through and as you listen to others about the Book of Revelation. You just need to have an understanding of what their what perspective they're coming from. Um, in the Bible in general, um, but specifically in the book of Revelation, there are many, many uh, key numbers. The number four is related to the earth and things of the earth. The number six is related to mankind or humankind. Uh, the number 12 is related to completeness, the 12 tribes of Israel, the 24 elders, which of course is a double 12, the types of fruit, the gates guarded by 12 angels, precious stones, pearls, and there are many other multiples of 12, including the 144,000. We'll talk about whether that's one group of 144,000 or two later on. And then the walls themselves, 144 cubics. So you see right here that numbers are incredibly important. We're going to talk about the number seven in a minute, which is the most common number in this book. Um, but just understand that, that numerology within scripture, and especially within in scripture that is highly symbolic um, is very important to under having a, a great understanding. Um, the As we go through the different chapters, we'll talk about the church age in chapters one through three, the tribulation or Daniel's, uh, or, or out of Daniel nine or Daniel's, uh, so this whole 70th week pers uh, perspective, we'll talk about that at length. That's usually the part that people really get interested in, which 
I think that's sad as the church because the first three uh, chapters of Revelation are amazing. The end of Revelation is is incredible. It provides great hope. Uh, if you if you understand that missionaries that go to these these countries where the church is persecuted. Um, they will find that Daniel and Revelation are often the favorite books. And you know why? Because it shows that Jesus wins. Jesus is triumphant. They already know that, but they're in a state of persecution. And we're going to talk about churches, even in John's time, that were being persecuted. And we'll see what Jesus said to these churches. Um, we'll talk about the kingdom age in chapter 20 and then about all of eternity in chapters 21 to 22. Again, some of the most amazing scriptures in, in the Bible. Uh, you'll find that many verses in the Revelation are used um, at funerals because there is hope uh, in our Lord Jesus Christ when we understand this particular book. I promised that we'd talk about the number seven. There are 21 number sevens in the book of, of Revelation, which, is, of course, uh, you can multiply that. Uh, that's three number sevens. So 21 number sevens, uh, seven churches, spirits, angels, lampstand, trumpets, stars, peals of thunder, lamps of fire, horns, seals, eyes, 7,000 people, heads, diadems, plagues, bowls, mountains, beatitudes, kings, and the I am's of Christ. That is not coincidental. There were, our, there were also the seven I am's of Christ in the gospel of John. So again, we're getting to see this consistency in scripture and how the Lord through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit showed John that this time was coming and this time was about Jesus. Um, the, uh, the visions themselves, uh, again, there are seven of those about the churches, the seals, the trumpets, the figures, the bowls, the judgments, and the triumphs. So again, here's this number of completeness, this number of perfection, this number that means so much to the Lord, including the creation week itself. So we see that the number seven is an incredibly important number from beginning to end of scripture. Uh, the key to understanding Revelation is to know what is literal and what is symbolic. And when you get to the symbolic, um, you're going to find out that even in the symbolic, um, that these images convey actual people, events, situations, items, uh, and all types of different things. But context is everything. This is the reason that those who study Revelation must also understand the Old Testament, the eternal promise to Israel, and the promises in Scripture that the church is not ordained to wrath. And again, I would go with this hermeneutical, which is interpretive law, if you will. You should treat it literally unless it is contextually symbolic. And even when it's symbolic, you should look at the context of what's being written, where it's being written in the book. Is it happening on earth? Is it happening in heaven? Where is it being written? That has a lot to do with how you're supposed to interpret it. Uh, I don't think that Revelation is nearly as difficult as people make it out to be. I think a lot of it has to do with a lack of understanding of how the Old Testament relates to the New Testament. Uh, and then, honestly, I think um, this is a mistake, I, I, and, and um, I, I'm not trying to be dogmatic, but I will just say that I think it is always a mistake when people try to um, replace covenant Israel with the church. We are the church, according to Romans 11, the church is grafted in. According to Galatians 3, the church is grafted in to Israel. And, and uh, Paul went so far as to say uh, to the Gentiles um, in Romans 11, hey, don't boast about being Christians when Israel is, is a whole missing uh, this blessing of understanding and knowing who Jesus Christ is. Don't brag about that. Understand that you are grafted into them, not the other way around. And so even though um, Israel has... Uh, it, as a whole, has missed Jesus Christ, 
there is this understanding in the revelation in scripture that Israel will return to the Lord and will have the special 70th week. Now, it will be a horrible time in, in many aspects and many respects. But at the same time, it will be a time of revival for Israel. God will use Jewish witnesses uh, that he personally sets aside to lead people to him. They'll finally have their eyes opened. You'll remember at the, at the end of Daniel, Daniel was told to seal up the vision. I believe Daniel was, I believe he was able to see a lot of what John was able to see. So he was told to seal it up. And then Jesus came along and gave this to John and said, tell the church. So there is a major purpose to understanding that the promises made in the Old Testament are now being fulfilled in the New Testament. So again, we are able to appreciate, understand, and, uh, and move into the book of Revelation with a much greater appreciation of the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. So here we have this great promise of God known as the Proto-Evangelium, uh, all the way back in Genesis where God promises that Satan uh, will attack Christ, but Christ will reign triumphant. And that is what we can praise the Lord for this morning, that we as the church uh, are in the church age. We are getting to, uh, we are, we are, we have the privilege of having an entire scripture uh, inspired completely and totally inerrantly by the Holy Spirit. And we're able to go and systematically look at these topics and these subjects from one end of the scriptures to the other. What a great privilege that is for us. Um, many of the of the Old Testament and New Testament people did not have that privilege. They had bits and pieces as, as the Holy Spirit inspired scripture all along. But we have a complete volume. At the end of that volume is this great book of Revelation. Next week, we're going to talk about Revelation chapter one. I, I had to laugh a few weeks ago because Pastor John said, if you had one go-to sermon that you were going to give, what would it be from? And I, and I always say Revelation chapter one. That is, that's my go-to. I guess it won't be at my current uh, church because, you know, I'll, I'll be doing it next week. Uh, but that is when I get, if I'm a guest somewhere and they, they ask me to preach, it is often out of that, out of this chapter is one of the greatest chapters in all of scripture. I pray that you enjoyed today as we move forward into the scriptures, uh, into Revelation uh, specifically, that you'll enjoy the study going along. God bless you, and we'll see you next time.